Daniel chapter 9. Right to it. Daniel chapter 9. Yep, share with Dorota, there you go. Okay, Daniel chapter 9, we're looking at verses 20 through verse 23. All right, no problem. Okay, Daniel chapter 9, you there now? Daniel 9, verse 20 through verse 23. Very interesting verses and I really wanted to give them to you so let's look at, let's look at them and then shall we all stand as we read God's word together everybody standing we look at God's word and whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God ready yea whilst I was speaking in prayer even the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Ready? At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the word of God. And we pray that you just, just give us a real holy hush here tonight and help us to all just listen and, and, and just bless us, Lord. I know Satan would love to disrupt. and I just pray that you'd help us all. We need your help. And I just pray that you'd just help us, Lord. We need it. And I pray that you also give us power to understand your word as well and as we look into it thank you so much for the the joy that we have to be here together tonight in this place and we ask this all in jesus name amen you may be seated thank you prophecy is a hard study it is a hard study many times people get it wrong okay uh, many times i've i've read books about biblical prophecy and i've and I'm, I'm sad to say I've read these books and I realize that people have gotten it wrong. And I have to tell you this, and it, this is a sad testimony, but uh, most of Christianity today, and I would say what we would call Christianity or what the world would call Christianity, uh, has got it all wrong concerning prophecy. There's just a small minority, a small minority that has it right. And then most, I would say, probably about 99% or 98%, it's a, it's a large percentage, has it all wrong. And you say, well, what are you trying, are you bragging? No, I'm not, folks, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm being just honest and straightforward with you. Uh, I've read books on it, I've studied the theology of it, and I'm telling you that most of what I see, what's called Christianity today, and when they look into biblical prophecy, and I'm going to give you an example tonight, okay? I'm going to give you an example. They get it wrong in a very, very serious way. And, um, and so here we have a situation where, where um, Daniel is speaking with uh, an angel, and the angel's going to come, and he's going to give him understanding. Now look, if you, you, verse 23, it says, At the beginning of thy supplication and commandment came forth, I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So, so there is proper interpretation interpretation of, of prophecy, okay, and, and, and we just need understanding. But let me give you an example of prophecy gone wrong, okay. I read a book some time ago, and I, and I have to tell you that most of what we would call Christianity today would take this interpretation, and it is completely wrong, and, there, and I want to show you what is correct. So keep your finger there and go to the book of Revelation, book of Revelation. We're going to look at the four horsemen in the book of Revelation. This is just an example, but tonight I'm going to teach you about the four horsemen in the book of Revelation. 
The Four Horsemen, the book of Revelation, is the final book of the Bible. So if you go all the way to the end of your Bible, uh, you'll find it is Revelation. And go to chapter 6. And you're going to learn about the four horsemen in the book of Revelation. Four horsemen. Very interesting study. And tonight's a little bit of a study because what we're doing tonight is we're, I'm going to try to help you to understand how you can get the proper interpretation of prophecy, okay? And uh, this is where I have read, I've read uh, books on this, but there's one book I read in particular. Uh, I couldn't finish the book because I got so upset with it uh, that it's that it just totally wrong. Um, the f there's four seals, or there's actually seven seals, and seals are on documents, okay? So you get a legal document, and it has a seal on it, doesn't it? Well, back in those days, they would use scrolls, okay? They would use a scroll, and uh, even back in the Middle Ages, they used scrolls in this country. And on the scroll would be a seal, and the seal would close the scroll, okay? So the scroll would, if it was open, then the seal would be broken by whoever opened it. And if, and if it was the wrong person, <laughs> they'd be in big trouble, okay? Now, in this situation, the right person is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is opening the seals, okay? He is opening the seals in chapter 6. And in chapter 6, when he opens the seals, the four first seals are four horsemen, okay? And these four horsemen are found in other books of the Bible. The book of Zechariah talks about the four horsemen. Okay? And then they come back again. And here and there in Revelation, they're talking about the four horsemen. And so, look at the four horsemen. This is the chap Look at verse 1 and 2, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder... One of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse. So there's the first one. What is the first one? A what? A white horse. Okay. I want you to remember that. He's the white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, who do you think that is? Who do you think that man on that white horse is? Jesus. That's Jesus. Okay. Anybody else? How many believe that that man on the white horse is Jesus Christ? Can I see your hand? I think it's the Antichrist. Okay, okay. He thinks it's the Antichrist. How many think it's Jesus? Hold your hand up again. I want to see if you... you okay, come on. Hold him up. Hold him up. You think that first horse is Jesus Christ. You're wrong. He's right. Okay? Um, no, that's not Jesus. Remember, he's the one opening the seals. Okay, he's opening the seals. Do you see that, folks? Now, now look at now. Seriously, look at that. All right, look at that. <laughs> yeah, it's good, isn't it? All right, he's opening the seals, isn't he? He opened the first seal. Look at the verse one. It says, "And when I saw the lamb, who is the lamb? That's Jesus. There, isn't it? Okay, Jesus doesn't open the the, the seal for Jesus. Do you see that? Okay." So, so, and that man is going forth to conquer. Now, guess what? Let me tell you something. Uh, you got, a, lot, a lot of you got it wrong, didn't you? Now, and I'm sorry to trap you like that, but guess what? Um, most of Christendom also gets that wrong because they're, it's in their books. And they say that's Jesus too. Now, they're wrong. They are so wrong. Uh, that is the Antichrist. There's no getting around it. He's given a bow. Why is he given a bow? Well, notice there's no arrows there. Okay? It just says he's given a bow. Now, can I tell you something? A bow without an arrow is no good. Do you, do you understand? If I, well, I guess I could hit somebody with a bow and knock him out, but really, that's not, the idea, that's not the idea behind a bow, is it? A bow, it needs an arrow to, to draw back and, and fling forward. Okay? So he's, he's given a bow, which is an instrument or implement of war, no doubt about that, right? But what he's showing is a, th is, is a war threat, okay? He's not picking up the missiles. He's just threatening with war. Do you see that? And he's given a crown, so he is a leader. There's no, no getting around that. And he goes forth conquering and to conquer, okay? So he's a conqueror. Jesus is already conquered, amen? When Jesus comes to this world, he will 
have conquered. Amen? He will smite the wicked with the sword of his mouth. He's found in Revelation chapter 19. So that is definitely not, that definitely not the Lord Jesus on that horse. That is definitely the Antichrist. You say, well, it's a white horse. Well, the, once again, the white horse symbolize, symbolizes somebody who is a king or somebody in authority. Uh, you know what? If I went down to Buckingham Palace right now, uh, and, and went into the art gallery of Buckingham Palace. Has anybody ever been in Buckingham Palace? Ever just done the tour of Buckingham Palace? Oh man, you ought to do that sometime. You can do that. There is, it doesn't cost a lot and you can actually go into the Buckingham Palace and you can see some of the artwork and some of that stuff, well all of it is very expensive. And there is one uh, uh, portrait, a huge portrait, with Charles I on a white horse. Okay? Charles I on a white horse. And uh, Charles I was a very small guy, and uh, by the way, he lost his head in 1649, so, but, but in the painting, I want to tell you, he has his head on his shoulders, uh, so that's good. But he's on a white horse, my friend. He's on a white horse. Uh, so that's very interesting. Uh, many of the leaders, if you ever look at paintings of, of, of leaders in victories and battles, the leader rides on a white horse. So it's very interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, like Napoleon and other leaders, they rode, they rode themselves on white horses and that horse symbolizes authority. So that can be the authority of somebody, but that's not the authority of Jesus Christ. If Jesus gives him the authority to rule. Jesus is going to give the Antichrist the authority to rule. It says it right there, okay? Jesus opens up the seal and the man appears on the white horse and that is the beast. That's the, that's the bad guy, okay? That's the world dictator that's going to rise up over the earth. And a lot of people, like I say, they think that's, they think that's Jesus, but that is not Jesus on that white horse, okay? God is not going to use us to perform a Christian crusade. You see that? He says he goes forth to conquer, okay? He doesn't use us to perform a Christian crusade. Uh, there's a lot of people in Christian groups that think that the church or the, the, the whole uh, entourage called the church is going to take over the world for Christ. Can I tell you something, my friend? That's not going to happen. I see the church is going apostate away from Christ. I don't see the church is going, getting stronger for Christ. And we all know that. So once again, uh, there's a lot of people that believe that. And I mean, I mean it. They're in pulpits all across our land. And I'm telling you, and I meet them, and I talk to them. And they believe that that man on that white horse is Jesus Christ when they're completely and utterly and sadly mistaken. That's the Antichrist. And I hate, I hate to say this, but a lot of people are going to be deceived in the future because they don't get prophecy correct. Okay, and this is just an example of that. Okay, now let's look at the second horseman. The first horseman is the Antichrist, right? We all understand that now? Okay, now let's look at the second horseman. And I lost my place, so I'm going back to it now. Hold on, hold on. Turn the page, turn the page. Where am I? Where am I? There it is. Okay, verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, and I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And he went, and there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Okay, now the second horseman is war. It's a red horse, okay? Red symbolizing the shedding of blood during war. Okay, people like once again, we're talking about the battlefields and people who died and the blood that they shed on the battlefield, the red horse, okay? So you see the white horse. Which one, who is the white horse? That's the Antichrist. So then the Antichrist is gonna have some people that aren't gonna follow him, so what's gonna happen? War, war will follow. But then there are people, then most of what I said, Christendom, they think that that's talking about the world wars. The world wars, okay? Now we've had two major world wars in our, in our history, in our recent history, in modern history, and they think that that's referring to these two world wars. Can I tell you something? That is not, that those are just beginners, okay? Those are not the end. That's the beginning. The world wars are the beginning of what's going to happen later. So there's going to be some pretty awful things that will happen to this world. And there are wars that will come in the future. And there is this future war. Who the By the way, we're, are we going to be here when the Antichrist appears? No, we're going to get raptured out of here. Amen? I'm glad about that. But nevertheless, he's coming. 
this Antichrist, this man of sin. All right? And he's going to cause war. Okay? He's going to go forth to conquer, and the people that don't want to be conquered, what's he going to do? He's going to pronounce what? War against them, and he's going to have put the arrow in the bow. He's going to start pulling the string back and, and flinging it out. Pulling the string back and flinging it out. So the red horse comes out. That's the second horse, wor horseman. Okay? Anybody who doesn't submit to the Antichrist will be at war against him. Okay? So that's the second horseman. Now the third horseman, verse 5 and 6. Okay? Back to Revelation chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. And when he'd opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and a lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, folks, we have famine. That's talking of famine, by the way. You say, how does that talk about famine? Okay, I'll explain it to you. That's the third horseman. He's black. He's a black horseman. Okay? And it's referring to famine. Okay? It's, it says a measure of, of wheat for a penny. Is it a measure of wheat for a penny? And then it says here, and three measures of barley for a penny. Okay? Now, a penny is a day's wages. Okay? A measure of wheat is just a small a small tiny measure okay now can you imagine working all day and just getting one measure a week for for a day's wages that's what that means okay so it's going to it's going to get very expensive in the world you say well that's happening now oh this is just the beginning of it this is not this is not what's going to happen in the future but there are people say oh well we're having worldwide famine now no we're not no, it's localized. It's in different parts of the world. There are regions in the world that are suffering greatly. There are, no doubt about it. But not the whole world. This is talking about a worldwide famine. Okay? That's not happened yet. But it will happen. But there are people, oh, well, you see, you've got wars happening. You've got famine happening. You've, you know, Jesus is going to come. And, no, 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 folks. That is a complete misinterpretation of, of prophecy. This is a future event. The seals have to follow their course. Amen? The first comes the white seal. Has the Antichrist come yet? No, he hasn't come yet. Okay? So then comes the red, red horse. The seal, this next seal is open. Now the red horse comes out. Who's, who, what happens? The Antichrist starts wars. Amen? So you have to follow that. the, the next thing, goes to the next thing. What's, what happens after war? Well, folks, when war happens, that takes away the workforce. The workforce goes to war, and they fight the war. And listen, I, I can tell you, a lot of times when people will give money to other countries that are suffering famine, and then that country takes the, the food and sells it and buys weapons, and the people starve. And that's true. Because they're fighting a battle. They're fighting a war. Wars cost money. They cost money to fight. Lots of money. Lots of money. So, so these wars cause famine okay cause famine young lady young, I want you to sit down right there and I want you to listen to me the rest of the message you can do it I know you can do it okay alright now next one the, is the fourth horseman look at verse 7 and 8 verse 7 and 8 so what do we got how many horsemen do we have so far three well, the first one is white the second one is Red. The third one is black. The white one stands for who? The Antichrist. What's the next one stand for? War. Who causes it? The Antichrist, the first one. Okay. What happens after war? Famine. Why? Because wars cost money and the workforce leaves and then the crops don't get, don't get um, taken in, the harvested, and that causes famine, doesn't it? Because the workforce isn't there. All right? They're dead. Okay, so what's the fourth one? Okay, look at verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his, and the name, his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them to take a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, to kill with hunger, and with, the, with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Those are the four sword of judgments. I'll explain it to you in a minute. The fourth horseman, horseman is death. 
It's a pale horse. Okay? Now it says one quarter of the earth immediately dies. Now we've had a lot of death in the world. But we have never had one quarter of the earth dying. How many people live in the earth now? Seven billion. What's one quarter of seven billion? Okay, can you imagine 1.75 billion people dying? Has that happened on our planet? Has that ever happened on our planet? Do you see? They've got it wrong, don't they? That's a future event. Oh yeah, we've had a lot of people die in war. World War II is especially awful. How many Russians died in World War II? Does anybody know? 29 million Russians died in World War II. 29 million. But that's a far cry from 1.7 billion people. You know, we, we think, oh, he's a billionaire. A billion is a lot of money. How much is a billion? A thousand million. Is it? Okay. How much is a million? It's 10,000 million, actually. 10,000 million. 10,000 million is one billion. So it's more than a thousand million. It's 10,000 million. 10,000 million. You think about that for a minute. 10,000 million. Would you like to have that? <laughs> That's a lot of money. You see, I'm a billionaire. How much do you have? 10,000 million. Wow. Now put that in the numbers of people. 1.7 billion people. That's nearly 2 billion. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. Is this all because of the famine and the war? Yeah. Well, it says here, there's the four, four sword judgments. Okay, the four sword judgments are there. You sure it's a thousand million? All right, well, we're going to study that. And I'll we're going to find out what a billion really is, okay? One time, we, we, I think it's 10,000 million, but okay, well, let's, we can check it out. We can check it out and find out. That's, that's interesting. But let, let's go to the four sore judgments. The four sore judgments are there, and what are they right there? Let's, let's, let's look at them. Okay, the first one is the sword. That's war. The sword is referring to war. The second one is hunger. So people dying from hunger. The third one is just simply death. Okay, death of some kind. And then the fourth one is with the beasts of the earth. So that's shark attack, that's, that's um, wolf attack, you, you name it, attack, snake attack, uh, insect attack, uh, any kind of a beast that's, that, that, that's poisonous, kills them. Okay? Folks, has that happened? Has one quarter of the earth died from sword and from fam famine and death and the beasts of the earth? And do you see the digression? You got the Antichrist. It, folks, if that's Jesus on the white horse, then why is all the death coming? Think about it for a minute. If that's Jesus on a white horse, conquering into conquer, then why on earth is the sword coming? Why on earth is the... De doesn't Jesus bring life? Doesn't He? Yeah, He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. What? Do you think a lot of people get it um, confused because they think Jesus is going to be served on the white horse? Yeah. I think they get confused because they look at the man on the white horse and they say, that's Jesus. Folks... He's a split personality, if, it, if that's true, in that, those verses. Because he's the lamb that opens the seal. Look at the verse 1 again. I saw the, when the lamb... Who is the lamb? Jesus. Opened the seals. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four, four beasts saying, come and see. So you see that? 
You see that? And then it says, I saw a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, this is just one example, okay, of getting prophecy wrong. Now, how can we get it right? Okay, let me show you how we get it right. Go back to Daniel chapter 9. Go back to Jan Daniel chapter 9. And I'm going to show you how we get it right. You say, how did you get it right? Okay, I'm going to show you. And lady, turn around, sit up and look at me. Thank you. Turn around. Sit up. Okay. Oh boy, it's awful, isn't it? Look at verse 20. Alright, verse 20. It says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. What's the first thing? Living the life of prayer. Do you see what he was doing? Listen, Daniel received great prophecy. Why did Daniel receive great prophecy? I'll tell you why. Because Daniel was a man of prayer. And if you want to understand prophecy, you need to learn how to pray. You need to learn how to have a life of prayer. Now I want you to see the different parts of his prayer in verse 20. He says, and whilst I was speaking, okay, God wants to hear our voices. Now, we can pray in our hearts, but can I tell you something? God also wants to hear our voices. God gave us His voice. He gave us the Word of God. Now God wants to hear our voice. Amen? And He was speaking. He was speaking. But not only that, He was praying. See, notice it says here, He was not just speaking. It says here, He was praying. Notice that. There's a conjunction there. He says, I was speaking and praying. Now what is praying? What is praying? Listen. Prayer is asking God. That's asking. In the court system, the, the barrister is learning. He says, I pray the court. What's he saying? He said, I want the court to listen to what I have to say. And I'm making this, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you something. Now use that, that term, and that's what it means. And prayer is asking, and God wants us to ask. And so he was asking God some things, wasn't he? Okay, what else was he doing? Look what he says here. He was not only speaking to God, he was not only praying to God, but what else was he doing? He was confessing to God. Yeah, he was confessing his sin, but not only his sin, but the sin of the people. 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we need to confess, amen, our sin. But not only our sin, but the sin of our people. You know, I believe in national sins. I believe that our people have sinned not only individually, but collectively and even nationally. What is the national sins of the people of this nation? Well, we need to discover it and we need to confess it. And that's what he was doing. He was a man of prayer. He was speaking to God. And listen, if we can get a hold of that, I guarantee if we could get a hold in, in, in a life of prayer, not only for us individually, but for our people collectively. You know, if you see something, uh, somebody has an issue or a problem, I remember what Brother Moore said. He stood up here and he said, what do you do when you see somebody having a problem in the church? What do you do? You bow your head and you pray for them. I love that. You know, we want to talk about it. We want to clear things up about it. But what we ought to do is pray about it. Amen? Amen. Praying. If we want a proper interpretation, then we need to learn how to pray. But not only that, we need to learn what supplication is. Notice there's four parts. He's speaking, he's praying, he's confessing, and he's supplicating. Okay? Notice verse 20 again. 
It says here, presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Okay? So what was he doing? He was supplicating. What's supplication? That's going for the deeds of somebody else. That's going on behalf of someone else. That's me praying for Gavin and going for Gavin's needs. And that's me going for Dave's needs. And that's, that's me going for Lee's needs. That's, that's, that's supplication. We need to supplicate. We need to pray for our families. We need to pray for our people. We need to pray for the members of our church. We need to supplicate for one another. And I believe that if we can get that right, I believe we can understand prophecy because you see, that's what Daniel did. Amen? Have a prayer time, yes. But pray without ceasing. Walk with God. Include Him in your life. And I believe this. If you include God in your life, His Holy Spirit will reveal to you the truth. And I believe the one of the reasons why we have a lot of theology that isn't right in the area of prophecy is because we have a lot of theologians who don't know anything about prayer. Nothing. Zero. Daniel knew what prayer was all about. That's why God put him in the Bible. Daniel was a man of prayer. We need to be people of prayer. And if we want to understand prophecy, we need to learn how to pray. Number two. Number one is by living a, play, a life of prayer. Number two is by being in the right place. Daniel was in the right place. Look at verse 21 and verse 22. It says, While I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening, evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. The reason why Gabriel came to Daniel is because Daniel was in a place, apparently, it says, he was about the time of the evening oblation. Oblation is a sacrifice. Daniel was very involved in his faith. Amen? He was very involved in his faith. And when we talk about sacrifice, in the Old Testament, the sacrifice is appointed to Jesus Christ. We already have the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen? So there's no more need for sacrifice. He already sacrificed. Now we just remember Him. That's what the Lord's Supper was tonight. It was just remembering this sacrifice that He did 2,000 years ago. Amen? But what I believe He's saying there... Wait a listen, young lady. Hey. Way to listen. You're doing good. I'm proud of you. Now, the reason why the reason why he was doing so good with God is because he was in the right place and we need to be in the right place. If we want to learn prophecy, then we need to be in the right place for God to speak to us. And where is that place? Where is that place? I believe it's right here. Amen. I believe it's right here where we're, we're, we're getting the Word of God taught and we're hearing the Word of God preached. Amen? But not only that, but during the week when we're in our Bibles. Listen, I gave you that Bible. I gave you that Bible so that you'd read it. I don't want it sitting up on a shelf somewhere. I want, I want you, to, you to take that Bible every day and I want you to read a portion of Scripture every day. If you just one chapter a day, fine. Just read one chapter a day. But read your Bible every day. Amen? You know the old saying, you know, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow. You ever seen that one? I'll show it to you, okay? It's read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. You know that one? And you grow, 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 grow. You know that one? Don't lead, read your Bible, forget to pray, and you shrink, shrink, shrink. That's a children's song. But it's good theology. It really is. Don't just, listen, don't be a dusting off your Bible Sunday Christian. You know, don't pick up your Bible off a shelf somewhere and then you'll see a ring of dust around it. Huh? And it, <coughs> like that, you know. And then you open it, it sounds like a squeaky hinge, you know. Eee! 
<laughs> Don't do that. Man, I like to see well-worn Bibles. I believe a well-worn Bible is a healthy church. Amen? I guarantee you Daniel had a well-worn Bible. I guarantee you Daniel was always in the right place. Man, you're here tonight. You're in the right place tonight. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. You're in the right place. But even so, that's what we, we need to live. We need to live in the things of God. I guarantee if you live in the things of God, God will teach you things that will amaze you. God will teach you things that will blow your mind. This book will blow your mind if you let it. This is an amazing book, this Bible. And a lot of people don't know it. A lot of people don't understand it. A lot of people get the wrong interpretation for it. And if we would just simply be in the right place, we'd get the interpretation. You know, Hebrews 10.25 says, it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So as you see the day approaching, we need to exhort one another. We need to build each other up. How do we build each other up if we're not in church building each other up? You can't build up somebody else if you're not here to build them up. How can I build you up? Can you see, here, you know, here comes Sunday, you know. Where's Pastor? He's gone. He's not here. Where is he? He's missing. How am I going to build you up if I'm not here? If I'm missing? If it's just a pulpit there? But the church is just isn't a pastor. Can you imagine me being up here by myself, preaching to myself? Be, the people will look in the window and say, look at that crazy American over there. He's, that Yankee, he's preaching to himself. I knew those Yankees were crazy. Yeah. It's true, isn't it? They are crazy. I'm, I'm one of them, amen. <laughs> Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. <laughs> you're, all just, you're all just waiting for me to bury myself. I can see it on your faces, you know. Just go ahead, Pastor, keep talking. Yeah. How can we build each other up if we're not here to build each other up? God wants us to build each other up, and that's why we need to be together in a church. We need to be a body. The church isn't a building. The church is people. The body of Christ is people. And we're building each other up in the faith. Amen? We're encouraging each other. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And I guarantee you, if we're doing that, if we're doing that, God's going to say, God's going to say Hey, Gabriel, it, let's, go t let's, go let's go tell them something. Let's go tell them about what's going to happen. Here's Daniel. He, I mean, he was so devoted to God. He was in the right place and God said, Hey, Gabriel, go down to Daniel. He's a, great, he's a man greatly beloved. I want Daniel to understand the future. He's praying for his people. Boy, he is a, he is a man of prayer, Gabriel. Go down there and talk to him. So Gabriel flew down there and he says, I've come to talk to you. He was in the right place. Amen? So how do we understand prophecy? By living the life of prayer. Number two, by being in the right place. And then lastly, and we'll close, by entering a privileged and close place to God. And I'm basically going in the same place. Sort of. I believe that Daniel was very special to God. Look at verse 23. In the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I've come to show thee Thou art, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. What did he say there? He said, thou art greatly beloved. Can I tell you something? Let me tell you a little secret. God does play favorites. He does play favorites. But it's up to us. It's up to us. Most of the followers of Jesus Christ were already followers of John the Baptist. 
And all it took was John the Baptist to point to Jesus Christ and say, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world and go with him. Just go. I must decrease, he must increase. Don't follow me anymore. And it literally took some of them the beheading of John the Baptist before they followed Jesus, but there were people that followed Jesus immediately and they became his apostles. They were his pets. And God had no respected persons, but let me tell you something. You can enter a place where you can be God's pet. How many would like to be God's pet? God's, uh, amen, me too. You know who is really God's pet in the Bible? Somebody asked me, which one's your favorite apostle? Somebody asked me that the other day. Without any hesitation, I'd say John. John, no doubt about it. Now, in the Last Supper, when the Lord gave the institution of the Lord's Supper, there was somebody leaning on his bosom. And Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And Peter said, ask John. He's really close to Jesus. And John's leaning on his bosom. He says, who is it, Lord? Was it John? No. Is it any wonder he received the revelation? Now, that gives me shivers. Is it any wonder? Because John was God's pet. He was close to God. And he wanted to be close to God. Listen, folks. It's up to you if you want to be God's pet. It's up to you. It's up to you. If you want to enter that privileged place, then it's up to you. Tonight. You say, how do I do that? Okay, I'll tell you how you do it. This is how I'm trying to do it. Number one, practice God's presence in your life all the time. Include Him all the time in your life. All the time. If you want to be God's pet, I mean, very close to God and God giving you wonderful revelation. I'm talking about, the Bible already got that, but I'm talking about revealing what's already written there and understanding prophecy in a very wonderful way. Then you need to practice His presence all the time. Look at His creation and thank Him for it. Look, I, you know what I love? I love the clouds. And I'll look at those clouds, and some of you have been with me when I say this. God made that just for me. I, he painted that picture just for me, and I'll say, listen, there's no way any man could take what God just painted tonight in that sky right now, and they couldn't duplicate it. There's nobody that could du duplicate that like God could. And God can do it just like that. No problem at all. He can just make a beautiful picture. He can take the moon. He can put the clouds going through the moon. He can, he can take a sunrise. He can take a sunset. He can make the clouds. He can make these clouds go through these clouds and make a beautiful, beautiful picture. And he can do it all the time. Well, you can just look at God's artwork. Today was a beautiful day. Did you see today? Did you enjoy today? Did you enjoy the colors of the leaves? Did you, did you enjoy as they came down softly into the ground? Did you, did you enjoy that? Did you enjoy that? Because God did that for us today. He painted a beautiful picture for us. And people, mm, through life. And I'm thinking, they're missing it. They're missing it. God painted a beautiful picture today and most people missed it. But if we practice God's presence all the time, I believe God will give us wonderful understanding of His Word. What's another way we can do it? Practice God's presence, number two. Live a life of personal holiness. Whatever's in your life that's not right, get it rid of it. You say, Pastor, you believe in holiness? I believe in holiness. You say, what is holiness? 
Holiness is when we live holy. When we live a separate life and we say, I'm not going to live that way anymore. I'm not going to listen to that music. I'm not going to watch that programming. I'm not going to involve myself in that. I'm going to do right. I'm going to live right. Do you think Daniel lived right? I know he lived right. Practice a life of personal holiness and God will give you wonderful understanding of His revealed Word. Can I tell you something? This book right here is more precious than gold that perisheth. Most people, even preachers, don't understand this book. But if preachers would walk with God and love God, and, and I'm not saying, listen, I've got a long ways to go and I'm working on it, but I want to be God's pet. I have a desire to be God's pet. I have a desire to have a, a special relationship with God. And we can all do that, Christians. Live a life of personal holiness. And then lastly, develop a tradition of praise. Just praise God all the time. We like to gripe, don't we? We like to moan about everything. But we ought to learn how to live a life of praise. There's always something to praise God. You know the song goes, Count your blessings, name them one by one. You say, what do I have to praise God for? Well, wake up and smell the coffee because you have a lot to praise God for. You've got ten, two hands, you've got two feet, you've got eyes, you have ears. Everybody has their faculties here. Isn't that enough to praise God for? Your heart's still beating. You're still living. You live in a beautiful planet. You say, it's not that beautiful. Oh, open your... Man, we live in some of the most beautiful land in the world. Just look at those hills over there. Get in your car and go 50 miles to the lakes and look at the lakes. Go along the coast there. It's beautiful. Enjoy your land. Enjoy the land God's given you. And there's beauty in every land. I come from Arizona. It's some of the most beautiful land in the world, I believe. You say it's desert. My wife says that. She says, where's the green? I say, there's every color in the rainbow here, honey. You got orange rocks and red rocks and all kinds of different rocks. We, we, we are the land of rocks, folks. We have rocks everywhere. Even my head's full of rocks. Amen? That's where I come from. Rockhead. Yeah. Rocks everywhere. Yellow rocks, pink rocks. You name it, rocks. Green rocks, blue rocks. We're the land of rocks. We have the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Some of the most beautiful, visual, Scenery you can imagine. I love it. You gonna make it? Yeah. I know it's tough for the kids. But you know they're doing a good job. They're trying. That's, 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 that's good. I like that. But folks, let me tell you something. You need to develop a tradition of praise. Do you have that? The reason why we don't understand prophecy is because we'd rather moan than praise. We'd rather complain than lift up Christ. And God hears that. He says, I sent you a sunrise this morning. It was beautiful. Why didn't you go and enjoy it? I gave you a beautiful sunset. The rain came down and it was beautiful. You know, you can enjoy rain. So it rains all, but I hate rain. Well, rain makes things beautiful. Rain makes things green. It really does. Listen, I, I grew up in a, once again, I grew up in a desert. You don't have rain? Boy, you look forward to rain. Boy, you're looking forward to a cloud coming along and it's really hot and you just would love for that cloud to just pour down some rain. And we, we see that cloud coming along and we say, oh, not again. Live a life of praise. This is what Daniel did. This is the, this is the secret of Daniel. The secret of Daniel is that Daniel prayed. He walked with God. He had a life of prayer. 
The secret of Daniel was he was in the right place. And the third thing was the secret of Daniel was he was a privileged man and he was going towards being a pet of God. And all I'm saying is we all have the same hours in the day. We can all grow to be God's special pet. You say, there's no way, Pastor, that I'll be God's special pet. You are wrong. You are deceived. You are so wrong. Everybody here can be God's special pet if we would let God work in our lives. But the question is, will we allow God to do that? And I guarantee if you do that, you'll understand prophecy. You'll understand it. You understand what the four horsemen are all about. So how did you get that, Pastor? Holy Spirit. Well, why doesn't he tell the other theologians? I don't know. I'm not their judge. But one thing I'm trying to do is, is develop a walk with God. I'm trying to develop a life of holiness. And I'm trying to develop a life of prayer. And I'm trying to put myself in a place of praise to God so that I can be God's special person. I, listen, I want... I, I envy John. I want to be next to the Lord Jesus. I want to be right there on his bosom looking up. I really do. And I don't know what I'm talking about right now, but that's what I want to do. I want to do that. And it's probably, it probably means a lot of suffering and trouble and hardship, but I just would love that. Not so I can just say I'm there. I just want to draw closer to him because that's the way God made me. And that's what we all ought to want to do. And our question is tonight, would you like to understand prophecy? Let's bow our heads for prayer. I'm done. Thank you for listening.